This Week on Waterways, a look at the book, Tropical Connections, and Protecting Spawning Fish Aggregations in the Florida Keys. South Florida's landscapes and seascapes, a quilt of ecosystems and habitats ranging from the dank muck of cypress swamps to the endless vistas of sawgrass prairies to the colorful kaleidoscope of the coral reefs. Much effort has been made in the last 20 years to better understand the intricacies of these ecosystems. Leading the way in much of the research are various government agencies, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and their science partners at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute and Florida International University. Since 1995, three long-term monitoring projects have been assessing the health of South Florida marine environment. One has examined water quality, one has looked at seagrass health, and yet another has focused on corals. Together, they comprise the main research components of the Sanctuary's Water Quality Protection Program. So I was asked to come down and uh, be the uh, chief scientist to try to keep the whole program running. And so uh, I did that in 1995 and uh, was there at the very beginning of our monitoring programs and saw them through to uh, my retirement uh, uh, a couple months ago. As chief scientist for EPA in the Florida Keys, Dr. Bill Krasinski was in a position that gave him access and familiarity with scores of scientists working in South Florida. In addition to the work being done by the Sanctuary's Water Quality Protection Program, there are hundreds of research projects conducted in South Florida every year. Ecologists monitoring habitat health, hydrologists tracking water flow, biologists analyzing fish populations. Amidst all this interaction with the preeminent scientific minds in South Florida, Dr. Krasinski got to thinking. So my idea was to produce a book uh, written for the layperson summarizing what we learned about the Keys and the water surrounding the Keys in the 15 years of monitoring that we were doing. But Dr. Krasinski, or Bill Kay as his friends and colleagues call him, couldn't do it alone. In 2006, I started working on a synthesis of the science about South Florida. I attended a meeting in the Florida Keys where I was directed to interact with Bill Krasinski from the Environmental Protection Agency because he was developing something similar. The contributors to the book Tropical Connections came from many different fields. In the end, 163 different experts wrote about their respective disciplines, their career contributions, representing nearly 5,000 years of professional expertise on the science of the South Florida ecosystem. Well, one of the things that surprised me the most when this book came out is I didn't realize just who would be contributing to this. We were just writing one small section and I didn't realize how, how uh, important and big this entire project was. I was really surprised by the, the amount of people and the different disciplines and the, the amount of experts that contributed to this. Why the name Tropical Connections? Because South Florida and the Florida Keys are where tropical and temperate zones meet. It's where the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean merge. It's where the seagrass beds, the mangrove islands, and the coral reefs all connect through their importance in the life cycle of many marine species and it's where water connects it all. Tropical Connections is such a fitting title for a book like this. Not only does it talk about the connections of the various habitats throughout the South Florida ecosystem, but it also really represents how the agencies are connected and how the agencies work together. A veritable alphabet soup of agencies and universities work on conservation issues in South Florida. And while information is shared between agencies and there are working groups that meet regularly among these organizations, there had never been a comprehensive yet easy to understand book for the public until now. I think it's a light read. 
I think the book uh, can be read by people that have no science background and um, can get a, a, a good understanding of what we know. It was intended for people uh, that had a lack of a science background. More than 450 bite-sized articles, complemented by colorful and illustrative graphics and photos, have been categorized into eight overarching thematic chapters. Chapter 1, Tropical Connections, Geographic Setting and Impacts to the Environment. That first chapter also deals with uh, big issues uh, that we're faced with. Uh, we, there are more endangered species in South Florida than probably any other square foot area in the world. We need to be protecting and conserving those that we have left. Chapter 2, Oceanographic Connectivity. This South Florida system is oceanographically connected to, uh, to, the, to the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean and South Atlantic Oceans. That's important because it brings currents to the Keys that bring animals to the Keys. Uh, and so it's the source of, of recruitment for many of the marine species that, that, in, that uh, spawn other places and are brought to the Keys with these, with these currents. And it's also important because it can bring uh, detrimental things to the Keys, pollution. Chapter three, water quality. Water quality is, is the lifeblood of the, of the South Florida ecosystem because if we didn't have clear, clean, low nutrient waters there, we wouldn't have seagrasses and we wouldn't have corals and those are the two main communities that, uh, that thrive in that, that, in that condition. Chapter 4, Coral Reefs and Hard Bottom Habitats. Coral reefs are the most diverse ecosystem in the world. Uh, they're, uh, they have more animals per square inch than uh, many other places in the world. Chapter 5, Seagrass Habitats. The seagrasses actually drive the energetics of a lot of the waters around the Keys, including the coral reef, and uh, all the productivity is in that shallow water. They grow up and drop their leaves and die, and that gets caught up, and uh, all the animals that are in those seagrass leaves and, and eating, eating in the seagrass leaves get transported out towards the reef, and they're dropped off as, as they go through that. So uh, when a tarpon eats a pinfish uh, at a patch reef, it probably came from a seagrass bed closer to shore that is part of this conveyor, energy conveyor system. Chapter six, mangrove habitats. The mangrove chapter provided most of the surprises for me. Many individuals think that these are stinky, buggy places and they don't want to go into mangroves, but that chapter really brought um, more knowledge about what's going on in the soils, in the roots, and in the trees, and all the different parts of the mangrove. Chapter 7, Animal Diversity. This book tries to uh, just highlight uh, many of the species that are more glamorous, uh, that uh, people recognize as being species that they would see in, in South Florida. Uh, dolphin, manatees, marine turtles, uh, sharks, uh, those kinds of uh, more glamorous species are highlighted in the book. And they're, they're important because it's the reason many people come to South Florida. Chapter 8, Human Connection. Uh, the last chapter in the book is on human connections. Um, we know that the keys are connected biologically uh, the Human Connections is, is, a, is a chapter trying to summarize how we can best manage the system.
We have some of the most diverse settings here in the Florida Keys than anywhere else in the wider Caribbean. We have more fish on our coral reefs. We have more invertebrates. We have more plants. We have more life, marine life, in the Florida Keys than anywhere else in the wider Caribbean because we are connected to the Gulf of Mexico and we are connected to the wider Caribbean. And it's that connection that makes South Florida and the Florida Keys so unique. Anyone who has visited, and everyone that lives here knows, there is something unique about this place, something worth preserving. Each chapter concludes with a, a charge to the reader of how they can become involved in helping the marine ecology of South Florida. Uh, the, the book itself is a, uh, is, a, uh, is a blueprint as to how you can become involved and help save the system that you appreciate. There are direct charges to the reader as to what they can do to help with water quality improvements, what they can do to help with seagrass restoration, what they can do to help with, with coral reef conservation uh, throughout, the, throughout the book. The book Tropical Connections was made possible in part by funding from Moat Marine Lab's Protect Our Reefs license plate. It can be found by searching online keywords Tropical Connections Book or by visiting the bookstore at the Florida Keys Eco Discovery Center in Key West. And it currently is in every single public school in South Florida. I recently learned that one of the local colleges was going to use this book for their environmental science curriculum as well. If you care about the South Florida marine ecosystem, and you, you do if you live there, or you do if you visited there, or you do if you've even heard about it, and, and are interested in maintaining biodiversity of the earth, this book then is a blueprint on how the layperson can get involved in helping with conservation of this marine ecosystem. It took many people to produce the book, it will take many more people to protect the health of the ecosystems described in the book. But it all starts with the individual, you, the viewer, to learn about the issues and find ways to be a part of the solution. As the sun peaks over the horizon in the Florida Keys, fishing boats are already on the move. Most days, these hard-working mariners leave the docks early, gear at the ready, and scatter to their respective fishing spots. But there are some days when commercial and recreational fishermen converge, connected by a common location and a common goal, to catch their limit on congregations of fish which have gathered together to reproduce. There are a couple of reasons why people target fish on the spawn, and it's actually something that I've cut back on uh, over the years. The first is it's easy fishing. I mean, if you're able to get on a group of fish that are in spawning mode, they're constantly, or at least my understanding anecdotally as an angler, is that they're constantly feeding in order uh, to maintain their energy levels for their spawning activities. Um, pretty much like shooting fish in a barrel. In the case of fish, such as snapper, and grouper, found in the Florida Keys, females release massive amounts of eggs into the water column, and the males release their sperm in response. These fish need to be in close proximity for fertilization in the water column to be successful, so the fish gather, or aggregate, in large groups, often by the thousands. Groupers um, are typically relatively solitary, so if you go out on the reef you might see um, one grouper here or one snapper there. At certain times of the year, um, those fish come together in uh, very predictable spots uh, to reproduce, and those typically associated with full moons, um, and that's of management concern because it makes them very susceptible to harvest by fishing. Healthy fish spawning aggregations are critical to maintaining sustainable fish populations. 
Through ocean currents, these aggregations will seed the reefs of the Florida Keys and beyond with new fish. But when fish aggregate, it makes them especially vulnerable to fishing pressure. One of the, the issues with these aggregations is that these are when mature individual fish from a relatively large area come to a single area uh, to reproduce, that puts the big reproductive individuals all in one site and makes them susceptible to harvest. Removing those individuals, um, and they can be removed relatively rapidly over a series of just a couple of years, can have um, significant reductions in the reproductive potential of these populations. It was the fishermen who first approached resource protection agencies concerned by the ever-decreasing size of spawning aggregations. Public concern prompted research partnerships with scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, the state of Florida, and the University of Miami. The goal? To study historic reef fish aggregation sites in the Florida Keys and to create detailed sea floor maps of the areas. The project would have direct implications for ecosystem management in Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. This project would not be able to occur without um, the, the considerable assistance from many uh, in the fishing community. So predominantly commercial fishers, some of them are retired, um, but many, many fishers have uh, been willing to sit down, talk with us, talk with us about aggregations that they've said that they've fished to depletion, um, aggregations that they're worried about being fished to depletion. The fishermen are incredibly knowledgeable. They, they know these waters so well. Scientists are the ones playing catch up um, and we can't do it without their help. I was born and raised in East Central Florida and been fishing in the Florida Keys for the last 25 years and uh, working professionally as a fishing guide for the last 20. 25 or 30 years ago, we had mutton snappers on the flats, tailing where you could actually target them like bonefish and permit and tarpon. Uh, also on the deeper coral heads in Hawks Channel, those fish just don't exist anymore. They're gone. So some of the areas that we've been researching, particularly in the Upper Keys, are areas where fishermen who gave us the information told us that they had um, depleted or, in their words, fished out those sites, um, many of them in the, in the 70s or 80s. Researchers from NOAA and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission set out to assess the characteristics of these historic spawning sites and determine if there was a common topographic attribute found across the various spawning areas. They also set out to determine if these historic aggregation sites were fished out, and if not, how many fish still gathered. We put researchers in, in small planes uh, during predicted uh, spawning aggregation times and, um, and typically fly the length of the keys and we may do this in the morning in the afternoon uh, on multiple days during uh, for example a full moon period where we expect spawning to occur um, and this allows us to look for aggregations of, of fishing vessels. Information gathered during aerial surveys helps direct the team's boat-based operations. Using the equivalent of a high-tech fish finder the research team then maps the aggregation site and surrounding seafloor for several miles. One of the things that we've been doing is looking at um, sort of what I might call habitat signatures of these aggregation sites. So we've been using um, acoustic mapping to go out and create um, fine scale bathymetry at these sites to try to look at whether there might be similar characteristics across the multiple aggregation sites, which might allow us to then predict where other aggregation sites would occur. We have these aggregations that were fished out up in certain areas of the Keys. We go and we map those sites, we look for certain features. We now have aggregation sites that are being actively fished. We go to those sites, we map them, and we look for certain features. Do these features match? If so, that would be very good information as far as being able to potentially predict future hotspots for conservation purposes. One of the management methods used to preserve and protect biodiversity is the use of marine protected areas. Just as areas of land may be set aside for specific uses, so too can parts of the ocean. Marine zones help protect sensitive natural resources from overuse separate conflicting uses, and preserve the diversity of life and the integrity of habitat.
Since the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary first established its marine zones in 1997, new science, emerging threats, and pleas from the public have arisen, highlighting the need for updated protection for the marine ecosystem, including spawning aggregations. You know, I used to be the editor of the world's largest saltwater recreational fishing magazine, and a lot of people in the recreational fishing community are against uh, MPAs, uh, marine protected areas, and you know the areas that we've set aside here in the Florida Keys, we really haven't lost that much. And in my experience, just over the last five or six years, I've seen a great increase in the viability of the recreational fishing surrounding those MPAs, uh, and I think they're a good idea. We know when we're talking about MPAs and their effect on outlying areas, uh, when you see what the research has shown about areas like Riley's Hump, which is a special research area off the Dry Tortugas and Fort Jefferson, in replenishing and recruitment for other reef areas up the line, uh, there's no doubt that that does spill over. You're going to catch larger fish, you're going to catch more variety of species, uh, bigger lobsters in those outlying areas where they, they use these MPAs to recharge and then move out into, uh, into the outlying areas. Protecting the areas where these fish spawn not only bolsters the fishery in South Florida and the Florida Keys, it also aids downstream fisheries. So that could mean that fish that are spawned west of Key West out in the Dry Tortugas might end their larval stage somewhere in the Lower Keys. It could mean that fish that are spawned off of Key West here in the Lower Keys might end their, lower, their larval stage up in the Upper Keys. It could mean that fish that are spawned in the Upper Keys um, move out of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and settle uh, farther north in Florida or even up the coast off of Georgia or in the Carolinas. As technology like fish finding sonar and GPS have made it easier for anglers to catch more fish, regulations and management must keep pace with the increase in harvest. One species that has caught the attention of anglers, fisheries managers, and conservationists alike is mutton snapper. Over the years, concerned anglers have approached resource managers regarding ever-increasing fishing pressure on two mutton snapper spawning aggregations off Key West, one at Western Dry Rocks and the other at an area known as Eyeglass Bar. Scientists continue their efforts to document both the spawning aggregations as well as the fishing pressure of mutton snapper at those sites. Our current regulations allow 10 fish per person per vessel. So if you have four people on a boat, you can keep 40 fish. Um, that's a little bit extreme, particularly when you're talking about the main brood stock uh, of a regal species like a mutton snapper. Everybody wants to be able to go out and fish. Fishing is a large portion of South Florida's economy. We want you to be able to go out and fish and to ensure that you will have fish 5, 10, 15 years from now, we have to make sure that they have the ability to reproduce successfully in Florida waters. One of the reasons that we should be worried about these spawning aggregations is that this is really how our resources are regenerated. And there are certain people, both in the recreational community and the commercial community, that believe that those resources belong to them. And uh, unfortunately, they don't belong to them. You know, if you live in Montana, uh, these fish belong to you, just as out there the, the brown trout and rainbow trout belong to me. I mean, they're a national treasure and a national resource, and that's why they need to be conserved. Spawning aggregations do more than replenish stocks for a single species like mutton or gray snapper. These aggregations represent a critical component of the larger coral reef ecosystem. Like legs on a stool, habitats, marine life, and the roles they play together must remain stable, viable, and whole in order to balance and support the larger ecosystem and the economy that depends on it. There has been a lot of support from key individuals who have, uh, have an understanding that we all want the same thing. We want you to have fish and have a job in 10 years. You want there to be fish so you can have a job in 10 years. So in the end, we all want the same thing. Some people um, 
understand that in order for this to happen, you have to be very sure that your fish can successfully reproduce. And that is the point of looking at these spawning aggregations, is to ensure that you will have future generations of fish growing up in the Florida Keys.